Thanks for joining us again on the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Today's podcast is with Tony Franklin, who is the offensive coordinator at Middle Tennessee State. Tony Franklin's done an outstanding job in his career as an air raid coach and one of the founding members of the air raid. And certainly he's taken in his own direction and does a lot of the things that they came up with back in their Kentucky days, as well as some things as he's continued to evolve. I really like what he's done with practice, and you can see how great of a teacher he is when you hear him talk about his perfect drill in this podcast. This is one I really enjoyed. It's been great to have Coach Franklin on a few times, as well as go and visit his clinic in Texas back in 2018. His OC Magic, that was something that was a great event with some great coaches there. And this is one you're going to enjoy. I am honored to be joined today by the offensive coordinator at Middle Tennessee State, Tony Franklin. Coach Franklin, great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Coach Franklin, I am sure most of our coaches, if not all of our coaches out there, know who you are and and know a lot about your background. Certainly, you've made a name for yourself, especially in the offensive side of this game, and you seem to have a track record of being able to go places and completely flip an offense and turn it into one of the best in the country. And you certainly have proved to do that as well as Middle Tennessee State. You guys were number two in Conference USA last year, number eight in the nation in offense. And it looks like you guys have a lot coming back and are on track to do something special here in 2018 as well. Well, I feel like we've got a a really good football team coming back on both sides of the ball. We're going to be a little bit different offensively than what we've been before because we believe we're going to be able to run the ball more effectively. And normally that's when I feel that whatever team I'm coaching is that has a chance to be special is if we can run the ball when we want to run it. And I feel like that's a, a very good possibility that that can happen this year. So I'm real, really excited about the upcoming season. And I know when a lot of coaches out there think of your offense, they certainly think of, of passing because you have been able to bring your offenses to the, the top of NCAA football and passing. But taking a look back, and I was watching some of your games from this past season, you're no stranger in getting into power formations and running the football either. That your system, though it's maybe based on a lot of three by one and, and two by two formations, you're willing and able to get into some power formations. In fact, I saw one where you're unbalanced, and I was was looking at the guy you had in at fullback, and they finally got a tight shot on him. He looked more like a tackle than he did a fullback, and it turns out he was one of your backup guards. Well, over the years, the thing that's changed in football is that so many people run spread offenses and four and five wide exclusively is that you don't really get matchups until you get in a big set. And the old school fullback, there's just not very many of those guys that are around to where that somebody that can line up in the backfield and, and ISO a defensive end or a linebacker catch the ball in the flat. Every now and then occasionally sneak a run into them and be really physical and tough. There's just not just not that very many guys. So over the years I've used offensive linemen and defensive linemen uh, when I want to get into a big set. And a lot of times you think you spread it out four and five wide to throw the football, but I think sometimes you spread it out four and five wide to run the football. And then sometimes you get into these big sets and you reduce it and you get into unbalanced and you make, you make them have to commit to the run to where that you can get a one-on-one matchup. And, and sometimes If you can't run the football when you get into those sets and they still are able to play two safeties and and still able to have help out over the top, then there's probably nothing you're going to do except just get beat. Sometimes that's what happens. You line up and you can get all the advantages you want and and you still, nothing works. And I tell my coaches at that point in time and my clients at that time, what do you do then? Well, you you punt, you know, (laughs) and, and hope like crazy that the defense can make plays and keep you in a game and I think that's part of being a good football coach is sometimes figuring it out and that is not to lose the game I got fired at Auburn and I coached in seven games one of those included the bowl game when I first got there and we put our offense in in nine days and nine practices actually and and went and played a really good Clemson team and we won the bowl game and 
and then we went on to the next season and, and we, we weren't very good on offense. And after six games into the season, we were four and two. So in the seven games I coached, we were five and two and, and, and I got fired and, and deserved to be fired just very simply from the standpoint that it was a really bad fit, a bad fit for, for Auburn, for their football players, a bad fit for their coaching staff. It was never a, a mesh between all that stuff. But when I go back and look at it, I'm pretty proud of the fact that that I figured out how not to lose games. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes as a coach, you got to drop your ego. And if your defense plays good, you just got to figure out how not to lose it. And, and that's part of part of growth sometimes from a young football coach to somebody that's been around it like I have since 1979. I'm glad you brought that up, Coach. I think I see that a lot today, especially in in young coaches who – want to make a a name for themselves in in this profession and they'll kind of give their offense a brand name and hang their hat on all those things but I think you especially would know this from your time in in coaching in high school and being a head football coach that at the end of the day it's about what you can do as a team and all that really matters is did you win or did you lose And, and ultimately did you score one more than the opponent and I think we make a mistake today as, as offensive coordinators. We get so focused on our offense and maybe not understanding how it fits. Like you said, it was a bad fit. How we can fit things into a program and how it fits with the other phases of the game. Well, it's true, and it's it's all part of a learning process. And today, especially with social media and, and young people understanding how to brand themselves, and that's all part of the deal, and the money is so outrageous in in college athletics and I'm glad that it is and I've benefited from that as well as as other coaches but what happens is that somewhere along the way you got to understand that if you don't win nothing else really matters and sometimes you've got to slow it down sometimes you've got to basically go into a four-minute offense and you got to do things that are going to help you win now sometimes if your defense is bad and and they can't stop anybody, then you can never take the pedal off and you just got to keep going. And a really good example, in the three years that we were at Louisiana Tech, year two and year three were uniquely different years. In year two, we were we were average on offense. And at the end of the year we got better and we were pretty decent on offense, but we weren't we weren't what I would call good. We were just average a little maybe a little above average. But we played really good defense and we did really good on special teams. And we won the WAC Conference Championship. Uh, the next year, we had one of the best offenses in the history of college football. We averaged 52 points a game. We lost to Texas A&M 59-57. The other two games we lost, we scored in the 40s. We scored, I think, eight games, more than 50 points. I mean, it was real, literally one of the best offenses in the history of college football. Right. But we didn't, win the cha- we didn't win the championship. We won the championship because the year before, we were good on defense and we were really good on special teams and we were average on offense. And so what you have to do as a coaching staff and as a coordinator, sometimes you got to figure out is that we're not good enough for me to keep doing what we're doing. I've got to adjust. I've got to be smart enough. I've got to drop your ego, worry about the job you've got right now and not as much about the next one. And And I think that, all of us at some time in our lives have been guilty of that, and I know that I probably have been. Well, Coach, obviously your system, what you now are back to calling the Tony Franklin system, is built on some very sound concepts. How much of it now is really about putting tools in there for coaches and allowing them to, to figure out what's the right tools to use with this team? Because I think any team, when you look at the full menu of the offense, maybe that, that you can put in, all of it doesn't fit with a particular set of personnel that you have for that particular year. So how do you go about from year to year yourself, but also for your clients, help in, in putting together something that is going to fit with that group? Well, it's fine. It's a really good question because, if you go back and you watch some of the seminars that I did back in the early 2000s and even then to probably all the way up until maybe 2010 or 11, you would hear me say things like, well, this is the way that you do it all the time and you need to be in this set, do it this way and all that. 
And I'm glad I didn't go back and listen to myself then because as a coach, I've grown. And my library is so big is that when I do a seminar and somebody becomes a client on a year-by-year basis is that they get access to this library, especially since Huddle's been created and everything is online, is they get a menu of so many things. And what my job is, is to try to teach them how to practice, how to game plan, show them the variety and why we use certain things based upon certain talent, and then how to have answers based upon the talent that you have and how to best utilize that talent. Being a high school football coach for 16 years taught me that I never know. Sometimes I'm one player away from having to change everything. I coached at high schools to were that the first head coaching job I had at Murray High School in 1983 in Murray, Kentucky. I had 19 players on the varsity. And I, I, I coached a whole lot different brand of football and the way I coach football than I coach when I have 115 kids Mm -hmm. at Middle Tennessee and but still even at Middle Tennessee you can lose two quarterbacks three quarterbacks in the season and all of a sudden being the wildcat and running a completely different offense with somebody that just happens to be your best football player that may not be able to throw it at all or like this past season we struggled at running back our starter was hurt and was out for a long part of the season Brent got hurt. We were struggling offensively, and we ran a fake punt against Florida Atlantic, and a 250-pound linebacker ran over a couple of guys. And and we went back and watched his high school film as a running back and decided, you know what, he might be better than anybody we have. And we flipped him over, and he rushes for 500 yards the last five or six games of the season and might be one of the best running backs I've ever seen. And so when you have a 250-pound guy running the ball, it changes everything. And, and changes how you build your offense and how you call plays and how you build formations and all that type of stuff. So the number one thing as a consultant that I try to do is to, number one, teach people that fundamentals are the most important thing. Coaching matters. Coaching really does make a difference. If everything is equal, coaching is going to determine the outcome of a game. If things are close to equal, then it's going to determine the outcome of a game. And then every every now and then, You'll see somebody with a lot less talent beat somebody with a lot more talent because of coaching and maybe a little bit of luck. And so we try to give them every tool in the toolbox that they can control in order to be the best that they can be and to give the best service to their kids so that their kids can be the best players that they can be. And it just so happens that now after doing that for the last 18 years is that our toolbox is really, really, really big. Mm -hmm. Coach, going back to the the beginning of the Tony Franklin system for you, obviously this has become a passion. It certainly, I think, does a good job for you in in, in far as bringing in income, but having been able to study this as part of a high school staff here in in Northeast Ohio, it it never came through that you were just throwing this content out there to to make a buck. What, What was the mission behind this what really drove you to say you know what it's not being done no one's doing this no one just takes their right. playbook and puts the whole thing out there why did you want to do that in the market yeah. in this profession right well it's really really a good question because there's no saying that desperation creates inspiration and that's what it was after the time i had at the university of kentucky and the way that it ended with controversy I couldn't get a job. Nobody would hire me. Nobody would even talk to me. I was trying to figure out, I had a little bit of entrepreneurial background. I was trying to figure out how can I survive and live and provide service to to people, but do something that I enjoy and not have to go back as a high school coach because being a high school football coach is the most rewarding thing that I've ever done as a human being. But it's also the most difficult job for nowhere near the financial benefits of coaching in college football and so out of desperation I said well you know I've been going to clinics all my life and I've always left frustrated I've gotten a play here or a play there I've gotten a drill here or a drill there but in reality I never walk away having everything in a toolbox that that I need to be successful so what if I could create something that 
would satisfy every need that I had as a, as a, as a coach. And if I could create it and make it unique, I'll charge a lot more money for it than what's ever been done because I'm going to give a whole lot more benefit. And what if I made it a year-round service to where you could get help whenever you needed help, whether that meant listening to a conference call or it meant calling in and asking for advice or it meant sending film in during the season and, and helping and letting us help you devise a game plan. How could we build this thing to make it worthwhile? And so that's how it started. And I started with, I think the first one I did, I had nine people and I had a brown paper bag and I had about eight VHS tapes in it. And, and I went and did a, a two day seminar and charged everybody, I think it was $995. And most of the people that came did it because they felt sorry for me and knew I needed money. And from there it grew to a few years later, USA Today did a feature story on me and, and the business. And, and then I got hired back into coaching and had some success. And, and there was a time where that business was better financially for me than coaching. Then the market crashed, the housing market crashed, everything happened. And I was no different than everybody else. It's, it went from a very, very lucrative business to a business that that has not been as lucrative financially, but I've still been able to to occasionally keep people hired and, and to provide incomes for other people as well as occasionally for myself as well. But we're actually on the crusp of trying to make it better all the time. I've got a new general manager that runs it and does an incredible job and does a great job with advice and, and helping people. And I think the biggest thing is, is that I really do care. I care about helping coaches get better and I, hear, I care about their lives. And I've gotten text messages and letters from clients that have gone from making $40,000 a year to making $250,000 a year as a coach. I've had former young guys that worked my camps that I eventually hired that went on to become head college coaches. So it's been a very, it's been something that's been a lot of fun to watch people have really, really incredible success in their, in their coaching lives, but also in their personal lives. So I've taken a lot of pride in it. Well, you, you essentially created an industry. In fact, everybody and his brother today is trying to put up a site that teaches a football system. But I can say this, having seen your materials, and it's it's been a while. I haven't looked at them in a while, but looking at that, looking at some of the 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 books that I keep on my shelf and go back to often, like Tubby Raymond's Delaware Wing T or Homer Smith's material, when I take in and strip away scheme out of those things, what it boils down to is and what I really get out of those resources, including yours, is teaching and coaching. And that people that put them together really value that part of it. And I think you've done an outstanding job in not just presenting a, a system of plays, but having every single answer behind it and teaching coaches how to practice. And I, I see a lot of guys actually will find your drills and put them online. And I kind of laugh at times because I, I, I'll watch a team maybe that has no business running a certain drill because it doesn't apply, but... I think more than anything, if, if, if I looked at your system, I would get out of it. This is, this is really how you put together a practice. And as coaches, this is how you put together an install or a game plan. Uh, I think that shines through. I think the, the biggest thing for me that, that when I go and watch a high school or college or an NFL team practice, I can almost always tell within 10 minutes as to whether or not that they're good football coaches or not by – how the practice is designed, how they hustle. Are they bored doing the same thing that they always do? And if they are bored, the players always know. I enjoy practice. Spring football mm -hmm. is still a tremendous amount of fun for me because you really get to focus on practice and not worrying about game playing, but just worrying about getting better with details. And so the one thing that, that I take a lot of pride in is trying to be the best practice team in the country, but also then to be able to teach that. And that's the one thing that in building the Tony Franklin system, the, the idea was to have literally a system to where that you can paint by numbers, you know, take a practice schedule, take a practice kit, script, have the video to be able to teach it, and then every single year make it better. 
you know, we used to have a drill called noose drill right. um, that we don't we, we don't call it that anymore for for a long story reason, but we now call it perfect drill. And the drill from how I learned it under how mummy in 1997 versus how we do it today is dramatically different because of all the things that over the years that I feel like are really important that in a two minute little drill is that we can start every day off with everybody doing everything perfect. Our pat and go cycle now is five station cycle now. It used to be you just ran and caught the ball, went and got in the back of the line and stood there for two minutes waiting to get your next ball thrown. And by the time you're done, you might've caught two or three balls. And our pat and go cycle now is a five station fundamental drill uh, that we're even this spring that we made a dramatic improvement in it this spring that we think is going to win us football games. It made us a lot better offense this spring because of one little change in how we did the drill. So I'm always looking for ideas. I listen to my clients. I've had guys that have been with me for 18 years, and I listen to them. I listen to their ideas. There's so many coaches that have been clients of mine that are a lot better football coaches than I ever could dream of being, and I listen to those guys, and I learn from them, and I copy what they do and try to use it to get better. I've always felt like the flow of coaching flows up. Uh, and I've said this for a long, long time. It's the first time that the NFL has actually maybe begun to realize it. And that is, is that high school coaches are the best, college coaches are the second best, and NFL coaches are the worst. And it used to be that all information flowed downhill. It went from the NFL to college, and then from college to high school. Not the case anymore. From the late Around 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, information started flowing up. High school to college, college finally to the NFL because they're so stubborn they don't want to do it. They want to say it's too simple, it's not hard enough, it's not complicated enough. And then you get some new blood in the NFL and you get former high school coach wins the Super Bowl this year. Mm -hmm. You get these young guys coming in that aren't afraid to do something that the NFL has never done. And so, all of a sudden, the NFL is basically we can we can kind of relate to it a little bit because it looks more like what we want to do and what we've done for a long time. Coach, I agree with you. The, the The practice side of this is so important. I think as a coach, for me, it's it's the most fun I have too. I always viewed it as my classroom, place where I'm going to see people grow and develop and help them in that way. And there's so much today on the internet. It's easy to learn scheme. And I, I agree with you and, and recommend the same way you do is that you go to the practice of, of somebody at the college level, the guys who are doing it for a living and, and are, are doing really well, and you're going to pick up some great ideas on how to practice. I know recently I went out to Ohio State and watched them practice, and there were things you saw them doing like, wow, I never thought about doing that that way. So, Coach, what what's something – I'm sure you pick up these things every single year. What, what's a few tips you might have, some recent ones that you've picked up that you can share with our listeners on on how to practice or how to improve practice? Well, the one thing is is that when, when you start practice, it's just the mental mindset of the coaching staff. And I tell all of the coaches that, that coach with me on the offensive side of the football is that the very moment we start, everything that happens – is going to be in direct relationship to you being serious about paying attention to details, you having enthusiasm and being excited about being on the field and and paying attention to details and bringing energy. If you do that, the kids will be fine. If you don't do that, then they're going to see through you and they're going to follow your lead. Sometimes players can overcome their, their coaches and, and win anyway, but that's usually – usually not the case. I guess the, the, the big thing going back to starting off the perfect part of the day where we do our perfect drill is that one of the things that I've done with that drill is to where that the quarterback gets a play call. So as everybody's doing it, you know, I'm making a play call. So it might be that I've said ace and we're running stick right or we're running stick left or whatever it may be. The quarterback takes a snap from the center or he spins the ball and catches an imaginary snap if we don't have the centers with us most of the time that we do. He begins his drop and he goes through read progression. He goes through the first three reads in the progression 
And then at, at, I always tell a QB, the very moment you hit your third read, you've, you've had to move in the pocket. There's no way in the world that, right. uh, and, and, uh, unless you're just incredibly lucky, is that when you get to the third read and you're getting ready to move on to the fourth read, is that you haven't had to move in the pocket. So at that point in the read progression, they began to use what we call our Manning Goff feet. You know, we used to call it just Peyton Manning typewriter feet, and now we call it Manning Goff feet. I told Jared when he was the first pick in the draft, I said, well, I'm going to throw you in there with it because that's one of the main reasons that you are the first pick in the draft is because of your pocket presence and feet. And so we work really hard on that. I watch their eyes go through read progression. They're working on avoiding the rush, finding throwing lanes. And then when the receiver breaks toward them, you know, making a perfect throw that goes away from the body of the defender. And the defender is with the receiver in this drill. We have a defender that goes with him. So the quarterback gets the look that there is a defender to one side. He throws a perfect ball to the opposite side. The receiver started with a perfect stance, a perfect release, perfect technique on knocking the hands off. As he works, the one thing that happens in college football and press is that you get grabbed and held. If you're a good DB, you're a good holder. And so we work the entire time in the perfect drill of knocking the hands off. We tell our receivers that if you got held, it's your own fault. Don't ever turn around and gripe to the official and complain. It's your fault if you got held. And so we work very hard on knocking the hands off in that drill, breaking toward the ball, exaggerating the look uh, of the football all the way to tuck. And then we do what we call welcoming it. We used to say turn up the, straight up the field. And then we'd say, well, who does that best in the NFL? Wes Welker. So we'd say turn straight up the field like Welker. And finally, we just started to call it Welker. So we just tell our guys Welker. It. And, and we, did, we actually have a Welker drill now during our Pat and Go station. It's a funny story. Welker came down to work out our receiver this year before the draft. And I told him, I said, just so you know, there's hundreds of high schools across the country that, that do what they call a Welker drill. Now I'm explain to him the theory. So he got a big, he got a big kick out of that. So in that drill, they turn straight up the field and then they finish running through a little gauntlet with the other receivers there to left uh, to where that they try to strip the football. So rather than, and, and, and you're only going to get probably two reps in two minutes, and that's fine. That's all I want. I just want the mindset of practice to start with I was in a perfect stance. I got a perfect release. I'm going to get held today, so I'm going to knock hands off. I'm going to exaggerate the look of the ball into the tuck. Quarterback's going to throw it away from the near defender. I'm going to trust the throw. I'm going to welcome it up the field. I'm going to keep the ball up high and tight with ball security. And my first thoughts of the day are that I did everything right. So when we rename the drill from a noose drill to perfect drill, it really fit the way that it was supposed to fit. So I'm proud of the fact that that drill has become a really important drill and I know a college coach right now, I won't say his name, but he's been incredibly successful. And he he kind of laughed at me one day and he said, you still do new drill? And I said, well, we call it perfect drill, but, you know, you know, sort of like that. And he goes, oh, I goes, as a waste of time, I don't do it anymore. And I thought to myself when he said that, it was about three years ago, I thought, wow, you know, this guy's a genius and the guru of gurus and all that stuff. And I said, it'd be interesting to see how how it does the next few years. And in my opinion, he's not been anywhere near as good on offense since he quit doing that drill. Probably has nothing to do with it, but to me, it does have something to do with it because basically what it told me was I've gotten really a whole lot smarter to where that I don't really need the fundamentals mm-hmm. as much anymore. Well, what I really like about how you set up the beginning of your practice is it really puts an extreme focus on doing things right and doing the details right. And like I said, with, with anything, you go out. I, I, I used to see this as a college coach going out to high school games and I'd be watching one team on one side, uh, running the exact same plays as the team on the other. And one team was so far ahead that you said those guys have the details. They, they either know all the details better than that other, other guy or they work them better or both. And I think that's what you have in, in the perfect drill. But I, I would... Which I'm sure you would emphasize that you guys are out there as coaches, coaching that up really hard too. That it's not time for you guys to just stand around and BS. And I see a lot of coaches kind of do that. They get out of school. <laughs> They're trying to decompress a little bit before they go into, you know, right. essentially their next classroom, and they make the mistake of not coaching things up early in practice, and and then wonder why the tone the rest of the practice isn't great. 
Well, I tell our, our coaches on our coaching staff, and I tell coaches at my at my seminar, is that if on Wednesday you had a receiver that in perfect drill didn't look a ball into the tuck, and he drops a ball and you lose a ball game because of the drop, it wasn't his fault. It was your fault. It was your fault because on Wednesday you didn't do your job. You didn't do what you're paid to do. And and people that work for me know that I can be an incredible horse's ass to them if they are not paying attention to details in practice. It is the details that make the difference and the details that lose ball games. I can go back and watch them and I can walk into an office and I can be incredibly hard on me and I can be incredibly hard on, on, on other guys if they're not paying attention to details. And at the same time, this past year, we, had, we weren't very good in the middle of the season, especially because we, we didn't have any players. We, we were more beat up than I've ever been since I've been coaching. We weren't very good. And I walk into the meeting room, and I told our coaches, I said, you know, there's certain things that we can control and certain things that we can't. We're going to be the best coaches that have ever lived. And we'll do the best that we can, and hopefully we get some guys back somewhere along the way, and maybe we can win enough games to find a way to get to a bowl game. And our coaching staff did a really good job of not letting it affect you. I think the thing that can happen is that you make the statement to yourself the word that, oh, my God, you know, we've lost seven guys. What are we going to do? There's no way we can do this, no way we can do that. And if you tell yourself that, you'll allow yourself to accept less than – the best and what i do is to try that when somebody goes down and somebody's hurt is that i always tell whoever the next player is i say hey you're gonna be better than that guy even though you know it's not true if you show in your body language and everything else that you just lost your best player and you look like oh my god what are we going to do now then your team's going to follow that lead if you act like the next guy or the scheme change that you're going to make is going to work then they'll usually find a way to believe in it Coach, I know you mentioned the Peyton golf drill, and I know Peyton Manning has been somebody that you've looked at and kind of studied, and a, a lot of what you're teaching the quarterback position, you learned from Peyton. What are some of those things, and I guess why Peyton Manning? What did you see in him that you were drawn to teach some of the things that he was doing? Well, the thing that I saw was that I saw somebody that obviously paid attention to the details of of the craft, but I also saw somebody that was willing to be a little bit different than most people in the NFL. If you ever heard the NFL talk about, you'll listen to some old NFL announcer, or even a young NFL announcer, and, and they'll go, well, he's got those happy feet back there, and you can't be a great quarterback with happy feet. Well, that's probably the dumbest statement that you could ever make, because Everything in football is about having great body position, having a great base, and being active. Quarterback is no different. And so in order to be able to have a great base to throw the football, the best way to get that base is to start with the feet as wide as the shoulders. But as you're moving from throwing lane on the left side in the A-gap to the right side in the A-gap, or from the right side A gap to the left side C gap, the best way to get there is to keep the base so that you can throw as you move to that gap. Mm -hmm. And that's what Manning did. He kept his feet incredibly hot, like a typewriter, a thousand miles an hour. And I don't even think that he probably realized how much that he does it. And I've been studying him for God for probably 10 years and just copying everything that I saw him do, not what he says he does. Because there's a difference in what he really does, and this is, happens with a lot of quarterbacks. If you watch their drill work, but then you watch what they actually really do, sometimes the drill work doesn't fit what they actually do. Right. And so what I tried to do was to build drills to teach what he did, not watch his drills to see you know what he was doing in his drill work. And so we, 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 we built what we call the Manning Goff typewriter feet footwork drills that we do. And, and we basically start every practice. I work my guys ass off and they know it's, it's time to work. When we get the quarterback individual drills, which we usually do during special teams, this isn't a happy go lucky period. Now, sometimes we got 20 minutes. We might have 10 minutes of one period, 10 minutes of another. If you get to game seven 
and you're drilling those guys for 20 minutes, they they can be dead. So sometimes, you know, we're going to have some dead time, but, but most of the time those guys are going to work and they know that that's how I believe that they can be better. They can be the best that they can be. And that's all we can ask. And I always tell people this, you can take a, a below average quarterback and make him average with great man and guy feet. You can take a good quarterback and you can make him great. And you can take a great quarterback and make him the first pick in the draft if they have everything else, if they can do that. And the thing that is so funny when you watch Jared as he was getting ready for the draft is that the thing that was his strength that he's so good at was his pocket presence, finding throwing lane, toughness, keeping his base alive and being able to move from, from these different positions to throw the football. And that's what everybody said, but nobody would say it as being something that he was trained to do. Mm-hmm. It was just a natural thing. Well, part of it is natural, but part of it is also a learned ability that some that, that you can teach anyone to get better at or where that they can become better in working in the pocket and within doing that. And then when you go to the NFL, there's, there's adjustments and changes to make. And Jared was very lucky in the fact that he got a great guy to train for the draft and Ryan Lindley and Ryan and I have since become good friends and, and actually are getting ready to venture together on, on putting a technique together to where that we use the style that I teach quarterbacks as, as well as what he does to get them ready for the draft because he got Jared and Carson Wentz and then he got Mitch Trubisky ready for the draft. And, and so he and I have gotten together and in, in the last few months put together something that we're going to be really proud of and, and should be able to release it here sometime in the next few months. Coach, I know years back you really fell in love with the idea of attaching a passing concept to the run game. Really, right. we're out at the forefront of the hottest trend right now, RPOs. And you really felt, reading about it, you felt that you guys would be able to, to keep it under wraps and as part of the system, allow your coaches to jump forward. But it was only a couple years before this thing took off and is a trend, right. but... What are your, some of your favorite things, talking about the practice and the details, some of your favorite things to do to, to train quarterbacks to be able to be proficient in the run-pass option? Because with, as with everything, decisions, footwork, timing, all take a lot of time on task. Well, it's funny it's, that you bring that up, too, because the, I still remember in my seminar in 2012 telling our clients, it may have been 2011, but I think it was 2012 where I really got into it. And I said, look, I said, this deal now that we're going to, that we're going to go through in depth, I, I need everybody in the room to sign these documents that you won't give it away. Cause I'm hoping we can get five years out of it before the rest of the world does it. Because if we get five years, we can, we can change our lives. Cause in, and basically what happened was that Dana Hogerson was speaking at my seminar and Dana used to speak every year before he became a head coach and he even spoke once or twice I think after that and obviously he he's got a lot more things to do uh, now besides uh, come spend a couple of days with us but I always got something value out of it and I'll never forget he was at Oklahoma State he was in the three back set he he spoke at my Dallas seminar after and he was just kind of casually you know Dana how he goes through stuff and, and he said yeah we're in this formation and he goes we got a run play call but he goes I just tell the quarterback that the two outside receivers, one of them's going to run a fade and the other one's going to run a comeback. And if they get one-on-one, we'll just throw it to them. And I was listening to him and I thought, that's the most genius thing I've ever heard in my life. You actually, in a run game, can have a run play called, have one or two receivers run routes and, and not have to tell anybody and just throw it to them. And I watched it on film and I thought, this, is, this might be the greatest thing ever. And so we went back in 2011, and we started to play with it. In the spring, we played with it. And then by, the, by halfway through the season, we were full go. I called a run play. There was no telling what I was going to call. I had no idea what I was doing. I would say stretch right, plug go left. Or I'd go stretch right, out left. Or I'd go stretch right, streak left. Or stretch right, double X, Z streak. And I was just making stuff up as we went along. And the quarterback would come up, and he had one rule. If you've got something really easy, always throw the ball because we don't have to block anybody. And people say, well, if it's five in the box, you automatically run the ball with your RPOs. I go, hell no. 
Do you know how many guys we got to block if there's five in the box? We got to block five. If we get four perfect blocks and one guy misses, we may not gain a yard. With this, we may not block one guy and still gain 10 yards, 15 yards, a touchdown. And that's where that next year became so magical because basically we were the only team in the country doing it the way that we were doing it. Nobody knew. So they'd see it on film and they didn't know what, they didn't know what to think. And, and that's basically how we, we had good football players. We had good coaching staff and we were able to maximize that to the fact that nobody else was doing it. And, and now everybody in the world is doing it. So it's not as effective as it once was. So my rules are these on RPOs. Number one is that if it's easy, Always throw it. If it's not, and what does it mean to be easy? Well, it could be fourth and one, and Jared Goff could have Kenny Waller in man press at Cal, and Kenny Waller may have a streak route on, and he might throw a 18-yard back shoulder throw to him, and everybody go, well, hell, that's not easy. That's dumb. You know, you had the numbers in the box, or you should just hand the ball off. And I go, well, if you watch them in practice, and you see how they do this? No, this is easy. Because these two guys have this amazing chemistry. So if you can figure out what your guy can do and what he's good at, and then he doesn't have an ego, and he's always going to do what's best for the team, that's the easiest way to do any RPO. Then you're not limited. Mm -hmm. You call run play, and you just make it up as you go along. You don't have to practice it. You just practice your, you practice your quick game and you practice your run game. And what I normally do in, in run game is that let's say that we're running a two-by-two two set we're going to run a power play to the right. So I might go ace power right or north power right and, and call uh, out left. All right, so now in that run game segment, the starting quarterback, if he's in, he's going to hand the ball off. And then when the ball is handed off, he then goes through the throwing motion with his eyes and his arm. And that's very important in RPOs. And that's the one big thing that coaches that are listening to this, watch your quarterback's eyes and watch his throwing motion. Don't just act like you're going to throw it and make the throwing motion. Make the throwing motion and then have your eyes stay on the receivers so that you have that in your background. And you go, oh, God, I made a mistake. I should have thrown the football on this. The next time that safety gives me that look or the nickel player gives me that look, I'll know because I saw what he did, and I did it because I wasn't watching the run. Mm -hmm. I was watching the throwing motion. I was, I was finishing through on it. And so the backup quarterback and the other backup quarterbacks in the meantime throw the ball to all the receivers. So they're getting that rep. So if I have a three-receiver route, one receiver blocking in a run play, all the other guys are catching balls. At the end of the day, our receivers are going to catch 50 to 100 more balls than probably anybody in the country that hasn't been to one of my seminars because we're throwing throughout the day in everything that we do. So if you're going to do RPOs, that's a great opportunity for your receivers to catch more balls. And when the receiver catches more balls, guess what he does in the game? He catches the ball better. He has better fundamentals and better details, but he also expects to get thrown the football. And he's not just going, oh, God, the running power. I'm never going to get the ball on this. So that's kind of some of the major coaching points on that. And that's something when I watch your film, your quarterbacks, this is going back to I was watching some Cal stuff earlier. Your guys actually do that. I saw that in every single one of your quarterbacks. It didn't matter where you were at or who that was. Is they were actually following through with that passing motion and their eyes were to the receiver, which obviously – is exactly what you're coaching them to do. And, and I love that idea of throwing the football to those guys, even though it's a run. It reminds me of, of what you used to do with just routes on air. Same type of thing now with a run game. Yeah, it is. And, and the routes on air concept of, of throwing five balls, or if you're at a small school with only 25 or 30 kids, then we just will throw the front side of the route and then we'll throw the back side of the route. Uh, because if you try to do five balls and, and you only have about six receivers, you spend all your time waiting, and those kids w will get worn out. And so we'll just do the front side of the route and the back side of the route, and we do that in college as the season goes on. A lot of our guys go to, a lot of go to scout team, and we get a lot of injuries, and we'll end up doing the same thing. But the one, there's a, a big thing that's really helped us in the routes on air period as well to save our legs, and that is 
and this is something that maybe maybe it's not as feasible in high school. It depends on what size of school you're at. But we have five trash cans that we label F H X Y Z, and the balls are in there. And we have enough balls to go through the drill to where that when the receiver catches and scores, instead of waiting for them to come back, because that's how we've always done it, they come back, get on the knee, and then they snap the ball, the other guys are lined up, you waste about yep. 10 to 15 seconds waiting on them to get back. But the other thing is you waste their legs mm-hmm. because they've had to run 35, 40 yards to come back. But what they do now when they score is that they stay there and they keep their ball with them. And the next group is up and they're going. And then when everybody's gone, we then – run the trash cans down to the other end and come back the other way. Mm -hmm. And we get more reps, better quality reps, and we save our guys' legs that they're not wasting time jogging back because all those things add up, especially as the season goes on. Well, Coach, I know our offensive coaches in the audience are going to love this episode. I'm excited to bring it to them. You do so many great things. You talked about so many great things today in the detail of it. If I were to ask you, Coach, though, in, in, in everything that you do as a football coach, what's the one thing you feel this all boils down to in terms of being able to give your players the winning edge? I think the number one thing is is to never get bored with details and to be a good teacher. I was a classroom teacher for 16 years in high school, and I enjoyed teaching. I was a high school and a middle school teacher and coach, and I believe that teaching matters and it makes a difference. Everybody wants to put in a pretty play and everybody's got some great verbiage that they can use and say things and all that. But when it all comes down to it, it's about being a good teacher. And I always tell coaches and I tell myself this, that really good product is your product and that really crappy product is your crappy product. When players aren't doing things, sure they're human beings and they mess up and they make mistakes and so do we but the bottom line is what you're looking at and watching on film you created that good or bad so take responsibility for it don't make excuses and never get bored with the details if you get bored with the details it's kind of probably time to to retire and to get out of the business and there's been times in my life where I wondered if it was time but I never when I walk out on the field I'd never have a day that I, that I go out and practice football that I don't like it. Now, I don't like a lot of the other stuff. Sometimes I don't, get a, uh, uh, I don't play as well with humans, but with young people, I love going out on the field and I love smelling the grass and I love coaching ball out on the field. And I think that's the number one thing I want to be remembered as is that I was a good teacher. I wasn't the best scheme guy. I wasn't the best this or that, but I was a really good teacher. Coach, I really appreciate you being on the show today. For our listeners out there, it's TonyFranklinFootball.com. You could get his contact information or email on Middle Tennessee State's website as well. Coach, thank you again for being on the podcast, and best of luck to you and your team in 2018. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for all you do. This is a good thing that you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.